Here we go. We did it one more time. Um, okay. We are going to do a weekly news roundup. How do you handle the news, stay engaged, and still stay healthy? And I'm Meredith Holly. I am a lawyer and a power dynamics facilitator and best-selling author and the founder of Ares Conflict Resolution, where we help employees stop sexual harassment without quitting their jobs. And I'm here with Erin. Yes, I'm Erin Leslie. I'm the client success manager at Eris and friend of Meredith and just love chatting all the things and pretty important to figure out how to stay sane in the midst of all the news cycles, especially yeah. right now, it seems like. I know. I didn't even include this in the title of what we're doing, but I feel like we have to take a little bit of time on the coronavirus for a second. Yeah. Is so I hadn't read this before, but I just was reading an article from Seattle about the care facility that basically has murdered everybody and has spread the virus. And then when I'm reading it, I found out it's this particular company, Life Care Centers of America, that we've had multiple cases against because they are like intentionally incompetent. And so the story was like the firefighter goes and is like, like goes to check out the center after they've been quarantined, walks into the center and all these nurses are just there in scrubs with no masks, no protective anything. And the firefighter's like, what's going on? Like you guys are in quarantine and you're not wearing any of the protective materials that you're supposed to have. And the nurse is like, what? Like, I wasn't told that there's any kind of quarantine. I wasn't informed of anything. So they're having like family members come in and out of this facility where they had already had two people die. And this is how now it's, it's like spread to South Carolina because, oh my gosh. It's so crazy, right? And like, this is, this actually <coughs> is perfect. It does tie so into like what we were going to talk about today anyways, because what we we're going to talk about is how companies themselves, HR departments, managers actually do have a huge stake in creating a healthy workplace culture and like right. making sure that they're doing the right things in yeah. their company from a leadership standpoint. And like, they're so many ramifications when they're not like <laughs> our cases are cases of nurses. Like we've represented nurses against this company because the nurses are seeing all this mismanagement, reporting it, all this incompetence, and then getting retaliated against for reporting it. And now we're seeing, and, and this is always our clients worst case scenario is somebody vulnerable is impacted by a company's like basically like commitment to not taking care of its people, right? And so then you see these people dying, like literally dying because of this kind of culture that's just fostered in a company where, and like, I think it's such an interesting thing because we see a lot of companies justify treating employees terribly, treating their patients or clients terribly based on saving money. But you have to think about like, at this point, this yeah. has become so expensive for them. Like it's so much more expensive to be incompetent well, and treat hugely, people. right? And like, if yeah. their actions have led to the spread of this, like in the US, like think about, and this is like a perfect example too, but think about how much in the long run that's going to affect their bottom line. Like that is such a clear, and this example is extreme, but that is such a clear example of like, if you don't walk your actions out and look at like long-term, like the consequences that they're going to have, like it, it's always better to like 
look at the long-term situation, like when it comes to stuff like this and same thing with the stuff that we deal with, like on a daily basis, like I think so much of it is companies like wanting to sweep it under the rug or to save money or whatever, when really like the amount to replace employees, the amount of like turnover, like the stuff that you have to deal with by not dealing with these like systemic issues at the core is like so much more, like it just like never expensive fails to like boggle my mind how people miss that. And then we see other companies, like some, we do have companies who will hire, like they'll identify a problem, a cultural health problem. Like we were just working with a city that did this. They identified a number of employees who were in a distress situation (laughs) and they hired us to come in and work with the employees. And I had the employees tell me I was looking for other jobs before we worked together like long-term employees who would have been so expensive to replace. And then we could step in and resolve the issue and help them feel empowered in their workplace and then get back to work and be effective in their work, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of like having this drag on productivity, on efficiency. And I think that like, we get so stuck in these ruts, like a lot of companies get so stuck in these ruts of like trying to cut small costs Mm -hmm. and trying to like ignore problems, hoping that they'll go away. And then you see, I mean, it does kind of make me proud of the clients that we've had who have identified these problems in their life care center facilities that they've worked at because they're the people on the front lines trying to prevent this kind of thing from happening, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Totally. Like, yeah, danger. I super wonder too, like, is this going to be your wake up call? Like, are you going to pay attention now? Probably not. I don't know. Who knows? (laughs) Are you so committed? Yeah. To, I I mean, and some of it is just like, like, to me, it boggles my mind because some of it is just like, be a decent person. Like, I don't even know how to explain this, but like, like like how people take care of them. Yeah. And how you can separate like your humanity and your morality from how you run Run your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's so, I mean, I know like we've had a lot of conversations just about the coronavirus in general of like, on the one hand, people are freaking out, right. And buying all the toilet paper at Costco And then on the other hand, a lot of people are like, it's just like the flu. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. And then sort of not taking it seriously when there are people who are vulnerable Mm -hmm. and potentially immune compromised who we do need to take it seriously for, right? Totally. I think it's interesting too. It's been interesting for me to to kind of like process. And this is why I never like knee jerk, like post stuff or talk about stuff like in particular, like that is of like a weighty nature like this, because I think what I saw like immediately is like people slapping stuff up all over the place. And like with something like this, information changes like daily, like protocols are daily, like people are just like throwing whatever out there. And I think that has led to so much of like, I was telling you, like, I need you to coach me around this a little bit because like, even my response has been so different. Like when I first heard about it, I was like, okay, like no big deal. But then the more I've heard about it, like I, I also like, I've had like strong reactions to like both sides because I feel like first of all, we're not doing the right thing. Like none of us are really like doing the right thing. And we're all still trying to figure that out together. Right. So we get a little bit of grace for that, but like, um, you know, just, you see like, like the meme game that has come out of this has been so strong and so amazing. And that has been delightful and funny. Um, But then on the flip side, you do have like, this is a real situation and it could get out of hand, like really quickly. And it's, it's, like more so about like the spread of it and how that could impact like our already broken like healthcare system. And like, you know, like there are people who are operating from a fear place of like, I don't know how this equates, but like, I have to go stock up on all the things for like a year because they're going to run out. I'm not going to be able to have what I need. Like, I feel safe if I can like stockpile 
all the things, but then that's creating the situation where like people who don't need 20 cases of sanitizing wipes have bought them all. So there's none left for people who actually are like wow. in the situation and need them or face masks or whatever, you know? Um, and so like, while on the one hand, it is funny, like I feel for the people who are operating from the fear, like the apocalypse is happening, like perspective, like it is ridiculous to look at, but then it also is causing like a serious situation. And on the other hand, there are these, these people, like you mentioned, who are immunocompromised. Like I realized, like, I'm not so worried about it for me, but I could very easily get it and not have like symptoms and be yeah. a carrier and spread it to friends and family, for instance, who, you know, are struggling with something like ALS or have been dealing with recurring bouts with cancer. And like how, like, like you look at like the memes and things that are happening and people not taking it seriously and how sucky for those like people in those situations and those populations to like have it be this big joke when like someone in your life is like or yourself even it has been dealing with this thing that is so big and so serious and this like virus that everybody is making fun of could be the thing that like takes them out yeah. you know like it just is rough all the I way mean, i think the thing that we do is we hear about a serious situation like this like we even saw this with the me too movement right like any kind of in the news cycle, very serious, like people are getting hurt kind of thing. I think that what happens is we see it in the news. We see this like article about the life care center where people have died, right? And we play out this future vision that's just an apocalyptic nightmare, right? And then we think that our alternative is not thinking about it at all or mm -hmm. treating it lightly. And whenever we're in that kind of binary thinking of I either have to pretend everything is 100% okay or play out this apocalyptic nightmare in my mind, you're in a bad space and you know there's like a thinking error happening, right? Because there are just tangible things that we do have control over every day that we can do. Like ignoring it and pretending everything's okay also is probably as dangerous as like playing out this apocalyptic fear nightmare where you have to go buy all the toilet paper at Costco, right? And then what we have control over is really like washing our hands. Mm -hmm. Like we just need to wash our hands more. We need to be conscious of washing our hands. We need to be conscious of what we touch every day. And like, that is the thing that we, it's like boring, right? Yeah. Like the, the solution is actually like the least sexy thing, right? Yeah. Like you yeah. know, like the solution is to like wash your hands all the time. And yeah. like, you know, like uh, social distancing has been like a, you know, term, but also like then that comes with a balance, right? Because like, yeah. yes, you want to social distance and not unnecessarily put yourself in situations with like tons of people, but yeah. also like if you're well, like still live your life, you know, but just yeah. be smart about that. Like, don't be done. And respectful. Yeah. 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 But I think that that's the thing is that the thing we have control over is always so boring and our brain wants to go to the exciting thing, like the apocalypse or the, it's just a joke thing. Yeah. And really like the boring part is the answer. Like the everyday, we, we see this with clients. I think that come to us, they're like, I'm ready to get on the stand in front of the judge. And I'm like, it's actually a bunch of paperwork that we're going to file. <laughs> And then we're going to get you into a good place in your life where you're feeling safe and you're feeling great. And it's so boring to them. They like yeah. want their law and order moment, which sometimes even when that comes is pretty anticlimactic in, in the actual way that it plays out. Totally. But our brains are so like, good at that, like future, like I mean, horror. This is what I've pinpointed. <laughs> around on this like next week perhaps because we don't have time today but yeah. this is like what I've pinpointed with like the bachelor as well like this whole like season yeah. and series I'm like that's the thing right like the the thing that probably is the right choice and is really going to work out for you is the it's thing boring. that seems more boring like yeah. the thing that's chaotic and drama and like there's so many obstacles yeah. and 
emotions are heightened and everybody's pissed. Like that's the thing you're drawn to because it's exciting. Like <laughs> exactly. It's like the shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean it can be dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. Like when we're talking about coronavirus, when we're talking about sexual harassment at work, when we're talking about all these things, it's like ends up being a dangerous way for our brain to play things. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. All right. So okay. do the boring yeah. thing, everyone. Like, yeah, do the boring it. thing. Boring Let it thing. be boring. Go wash your hands. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Although I have appreciated, there's lots of people putting out like, these are the songs you could sing while you're washing yeah. your hands. Make sure yeah. that you know you're like washing for long enough. I've seen lots of different versions of that, like 90 songs, Broadway musicals. Like There's a, there's a generator. There's like an online generator oh, where you can yeah. put any song in it. And oh it'll God, like, you might need the link to that in the yeah. comments. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh gosh, so good. <laughs> Boy. Okay, so let's get going on what we actually meant to talk about. Um, I know. I'm so sidetracked. Okay. So um, yeah, you got it? Take yeah, it away. Yeah. So um last year employers paid out a record sixty-eight point two million dollars to those with sexual harassment violations um through the EEOC. So that's something that's been kind of on our list for a while. And you and I kind of talked about this, but maybe we can talk about like That doesn't like what that signifies to me is that more people made allegations, not that people are getting like huge payouts, but that the, the increment that people were reporting went up like so much more is that, which I think is typically true. I haven't looked at these particular statistics. We should have Lexi do a study of it. One, um, in 2015, I think, and the average, like compensation that an employee got when they reported sexual harassment or filed with the EEOC. And this is just through the EEOC process, which isn't a great process. So it's different if you have an attorney, but the average compensation was $10,000 for, and, and the articles though would say, $1.3 $1.3 million payout for sexual harassment. But what when you looked into it, it was like 87 employees right. complained. And so the average of what people got across the board was around $10,000. And so like people have a misconception that bringing an employment claim is like a windfall or like you're lucky if you have an employment or the, or even that employees want to look for employment claims and that they're like making them like, like they're going to get rich. They're making up a story or something. (laughs) They're going to get rich and like never have to work again or something. And the reality is that like, it's just not like that. Like it's not a area that anyone's getting rich on, but like, It does show, I mean, when you like in these cases where a company is paying out like $1.3 million to 87 employees who have a problem, that company is still like, like how much have they already in, like that doesn't even cover what they've already invested in turnover in the employees who aren't reporting in the low productivity of a situation like that, right? It's like, it's so expensive for a company. And then the employees end up in this situation where often they're like, Hmm. I guess that was worth it. Totally. Well, and the interesting thing I think is that, um, by like a wide margin, the most common claim employers faced was retaliation. So like, Mm -hmm. not only do they have this problem that is like so expensive, but they're so invested in like not actually solving it that they're like heaping onto it then. Right. By being like, we're not going to solve it. Well, and what I see is so many employers don't understand that you can solve it. Right. And that there are steps that you can take to resolve issues and even maintain all the employees in a lot of situations where it's an addressable issue, where it's like a behavior change maybe needs to happen, but And that's basically what we've seen, right? I mean, I feel like in as long as I've worked with you, the companies that are invested in solving it and come early enough 
a hundred percent of the time it is resolved and fixed and the company fares way better. And yeah. all the employees are super happy with the result and everyone continues to work together. It's the companies that are super invested in not solving the problem or like way down the road, and like ignoring it, basically hoping yeah. that it'll go away. Right. Yeah. I think that those are the ones where it's so expensive, but I do think pretty commonly, I see a lot of people come to me and have an unrealistic idea of how committed employees are to their jobs or an unrealistic idea of employees feeling safer than they do in their jobs. Like I quite frequently have a supervisor come to me when a company hires me to help an employee and the supervisor will say, you know, she's doing fine in general. She's just a little unhappy. She doesn't go in the break room anymore because the guy is there, but she's fine. And then the employee will tell me I put in 10 job applications last week for jobs that pay way less because I have to get out of here because I don't feel safe and I don't know how to feel safe, right? Like employees are not typically upfront reporting how much distress they're having in these situations. And then the supervisors and managers often have, and HR people have an unrealistic downplay of the seriousness of the issues. Right. right? And I think that it makes sense because a lot of times the supervisor will look at the harasser and be like, that guy. Right. <laughs> I'm not scared of him or I'm not, <laughs> yeah, right. Possibly do. Right. Right. You so much. Right. Right. And so you think if I'm not scared of him, nobody's scared of him, which is just not realistic. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and then you, you wanted to talk about the NDAs because that's often yeah so I think two of the like super prevalent like latest I think maybe like in the news kind of stories around this would be um Susan Fowler who was at Uber whose book just came out yeah um, yay for her book I can't wait for us to read it we have I know, to I'm excited to read it too I'm super excited and then Deborah Dugan at the Recording Academy with the whole Grammy um, situation. And I think the thing that's similar about those two is they both worked in a, or ended up working in a toxic work environment. And it had been like this for ever. And nobody had just like been willing to confront it and bring it forward until they did. Or I shouldn't say nobody, cause I don't know, I wasn't there, but it wasn't taken seriously or like brought to the forefront. Right. Until they like specifically kept fighting for it. Um, and so, and both of them faced like pretty serious, like retaliation from the company. Like Deborah Dugan was removed. Yeah. Like she got fired basically. Yeah. Um, and then Susan Fowler, I think she was fired too. Wasn't she? Yeah. I think she ended up. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what happened with her, but she was like stalked. Like they hired private investigators to like yeah. stalk her and like were super threatening and like, yeah. So I don't remember if they actually ended up firing her or if she left, but like, which just shows how committed people actually are to these cultures, right? right. Like at the point when you're hiring a private investigator and to stopping intimidate somebody personal life, like that's like, pretty intense. That's when you're actually committed to sexual harassment as a culture, right? You know? yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's, those are the people. And I, I don't think this is the majority of people, but I think that there are people who are like, no, I deserve to treat women however I want to treat women. Yeah. And like, you're attacking me by not wanting to be harassed. Yes. Yeah. I think that's real. Right. I mean, well, and to like throw it back to our good pal Harvey, like for a minute, cause he yeah. got Today. Like, I think that is, and the Victoria's Secret thing that we talked about, yeah. like, there are definitely, I agree with you. I don't think it's the majority, but there are definitely people out there, mostly men, uh, you know, older. who have totally benefited from a culture of sexual harassment and misogyny. Yes. And feel like, oh my gosh, like I can, you know, like, this is not a big deal. Like I should be able to like continue treating people how I've always treated them and like why is this a situation which I think it's so exciting about Susan Fowler's book and then um 
Chanel Miller, the Know My Name story. We need to read that one too when you talk about it. Yes. Yeah. I want to read that next week um, while we're away, but but like, and then seeing and Deborah, the person in Brock Turner, right? Yeah. Like, she yeah. was the Stanford yeah. Brock Turner attacked her. And then he was like sentenced to nothing because he was a swim champion and had a rich dad. And so she wrote her book and then Susan Fowler, everything that we've read about it is about her really like just having always had this sense of self-possession and of right and wrong and of what a workplace culture is supposed to be like. So she walked into this situation almost like innocently being like, no, that's not how we treat people. We keep our hands to ourselves, right? Right. Yeah. In fact, I think like- At Uber. It, have we said she's the whistleblower at yeah. Uber? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read something that was like, she had actually dealt with harassment in previous jobs and was so hopeful about going to work at Uber because it was a large established company with an HR department, you know, like she had all these illusions about like what that meant. I have super strong opinions about like how people should treat each other. And I'm so excited to go work for this company. That's got this figured out. Right. Yeah. And, got there and was like, holy shoot. Like, this is not, this is not what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> fascinating right yeah. and so but then what you see and I think this is the inspiring part about it and this is why I'm always like I think in all of these stories there's a hero and if we if we intentionally focus on the hero and are inspired by the hero and then we're not like I think that the biggest danger when we're dealing with the news and dealing with our own health around the news is that we think that life should be safe we mm. think that like our lives should be safe and the world should be safe. And just the assumption that things should be safe put us into this like tension with reality, right? Yeah. Because it's not. Did you share that quote? Is it a Buddhist quote about like putting the shoes on? Like, yeah, yeah. So um, it's basically says the world is sharp. And we try to run around the world covering it with leather so that we don't get cut, but instead we just have to make shoes. And I think that a lot of times what we do is we run around the sharp world with no, nothing, like no leather, no, we're like, it should be soft. Yeah. yeah. And then we're shocked when it's not. And, and, and then I think the inspiring thing about these people is that we're raising the bar of what we're not willing to tolerate, right? Which I love, like that is the hopeful, shiny spot, right? Yeah. Like that is like in all of this, like it, this applies across the board to all the things, but that is the like hopeful, shiny spot of like the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that they are taking a stand, like if we look for the hero and what they're doing and their actions, like that is the main takeaway of like, we are talking about like what we are willing to like put yeah. up with and the kind of behavior that is okay. And honestly, how you get to treat me too. And like your responsibility yeah. in that, you know, yeah, totally. And I think that that's amazing because a lot of employees, uh, specifically women, a lot of women that I talk to are people who are raised as women, even if they don't currently identify as women have a expectation that their bodies can be violated. And sometimes I'll ask people, do you feel safe in this space? And they'll say, yes, I do. And I'll say, well, that's interesting because you told me that if you go into that space, somebody's going to touch you without your permission. And they're like, well, yeah, but they're not going to like murder me. So like our level is, am I going to get murdered? Right. And otherwise, and so we're raising the level of like, I don't get touched unless it's with my permission. I don't have people talk to me in a demeaning way unless it's with my permission and kind of almost embracing this idea of what do we think is sharp even? Mm -hmm. Like what do we think is acceptable and being willing, and, and like the Buddhist quote is like, if you're willing to wear shoes, then you expect things to be sharp, but you always take care of yourself. Like you mm -hmm. always have a commitment to yourself that even when you encounter something that is not what you're willing to tolerate, you 
set consequences, you enforce your boundaries, you keep yourself safe and commit to that, you know? Yeah. Which I think that these women are such a good example of. So the Deborah Dugan story with the Grammys from what we read, like one of the things that was happening is she was being propositioned by the Grammys general counsel at parties, right? right? And I think that if you look back even 10 years ago, we're like, yeah, of course she was. Well, that's one of those, like, it's just how it is. Like, you know, like you should just deal with that, like sweep it under the rug. Like that's just how it is. Like comes with the territory, like, you know, yeah. that's one of those things. But what if we're so inspired to create even like a, a actually healthy culture and actually like move forward towards what is an ideal workplace culture? What does it mean to be productive and really create things in the world? And then of course you don't tolerate that, right? Of course yeah. you don't tolerate demeaning conversation, like demeaning statements, yeah. um, all of that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Leah is losing her mind. I don't know if you can hear her. I can hear her a little bit, but not that okay, much. Okay, good. I'm glad yeah. it's not loud. <laughs> it's not loud. Yeah. yeah. They're in my bedroom, but she, her bark collar must have turned off or something. She's yeah. quite displeased. She's howling and scratching and barking. You'll <laughs> know if we can hear it loud because Pemel will, Pemel say, will yeah. start yeah. to her group. We'll just have like yeah. a whole cacophony of dogs yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think it's, um, it's definitely amazing and inspiring to watch. And that is like such a good takeaway. Speaking about those women in particular, and even like, we're going to talk about Elizabeth Warren in a little bit, but like, um, you know, NDAs have been like non-disclosure agreements have been a huge, mm -hmm. like, talking point lately, um, and hot button issue. Um, can you talk about those a little bit, like your perspective and then also like where else you think like management and HR, like get it wrong when it comes to like initially dealing with this kind of stuff or like what they could do better maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing that everybody kind of gets wrong about it, whether it's the employees or management side is that we think if we don't talk about it, it will go away. We think if we ignore it and, and non-disclosure agreements are a good example of that, right? It's like, treats the talking about it as the problem instead of the conduct as the problem. And anytime I think that we're treating talking about something as a problem, you know there's a lot of work to do there. Because the only reason that you really, that I think that we really resist talking about sexual harassment or discrimination in general is that we have so much moral stigma around it, particularly sexual harassment, because it we think of it as relating to sex, right? Even though it doesn't really like sexual harassment is any kind of gender-based targeting of anybody. It could be men or women or any other gender, right? Um, so it's not necessarily related to sex, but when people think about it, they think don't talk about sex. Like, yeah there's so much stigma in culture about just that topic. And then the violent expressions of that topic are that much more stigmatized. And so then I think what we do is we get into this cycle of thinking if we don't talk about it, it's not happening, which is, has not worked. Right, right. That hasn't played out real well for us. Like that doesn't tend to... Yeah. And then I think people aren't taught how to talk about it. Right. Like we think that if like a lot of women think if we talk about our experiences of sexual harassment, that we are attacking men. Right. Or we're saying that all men are bad or something. And men think if they talk about it, then they're going to say the wrong thing and be accused falsely of some kind of nefarious intent. Right. And the reality is that like, we are just raised in a culture that has discrimination in it. Right. It's like, it's exactly like what we're talking about with the coronavirus is like, if we ignore it, or if we play out this like apocalyptic future of it, then we actually don't address what we have control over. Right. Germs washing our hands. And so like the same is true when we're not willing to talk about harassment and discrimination, it's like ignoring the coronavirus. Like we're not actually addressing it. We're not acknowledging that our culture is 
steeped in a lot of discrimination, a lot of discriminatory ideas, and we don't even know how we've absorbed it. Just the same as if you don't actively have coronavirus, you don't know if you have those germs on your hands, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to address it, right? To look at it, to talk about it. The trouble with non-disclosure agreements is like, so a non-disclosure agreement basically says you're never going to talk about your experience again. And that is like pretty unmanageable to enforce right. and like a lot of processing these experiences is about talking about them. Right. And it also sort of exaggerates often. I mean, some of these experiences are violent experiences, are really like horrific experiences. The vast majority of discrimination and harassment is not an actually physically violent experience. It's just a example of unacceptable bias, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we're not, when we're like, it's too dangerous to talk about it, it also like makes the experience that much more um, powerful or like, instead of just being like, yeah, we do all, we were raised in a culture that's discriminatory. Like, how are we going to deal with this? It like guarantees that it festers and turns into a bigger thing. I will say though, like in Oregon, I've never seen a non-disclosure agreement be a sticking point for a case. Like it's going to be, it's, it come this October, it'll be illegal to have any kind of confidentiality or non-disclosure in an employment agreement at all. In Oregon, I have never agreed to one in any case that we've had, and I've never seen it be a problem with any opposing counsel attorney. It's just not really the Oregon culture, I guess. And generally, when there is a non-disclosure agreement, um, we're talking about these very high level employees who already had that built into their employment contract as a result of like a multi-million dollar employment contract. Right. It's so, not a specific separate thing. Yeah. It, often. And so yeah. like when you're talking about like the people who are in the news and the people who are talking about um, non-disclosure agreements, you're often talking about celebrities as this, like, it's kind of a celebrity problem. It's not really an everyday employee in my experience for the most part like most employers, unless you have a multi-million dollar contract built in with a preset non-disclosure agreement, um, it, it's kind of a separate class of problem. Right. I always think it's funny because a lot of celebrities have taken on this cause of like arbitration clauses and non-disclosure agreements. And I always think like, it's pretty nice up there at the top where <laughs> That's your not that it's not a problem. It's totally a problem if anybody agrees to it. I've just never seen it be a major sticking point in any agreement. Like I just say no. Yeah. And then they're like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's just not <laughs> ever been a problem. Cool. That's good. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I realized I that I do actually have. Do you need to go? uh call at um one so I just need to lock this meeting to make sure okay we'll wrap it up I think we can wrap it up we pretty much talked about everything already I think just um just the idea that like companies can be involved in the solution that yeah they're and that companies can and should be involved and that the story doesn't usually end, especially lately with like the triumphant revenge of the company who's so committed to like keep these things in place, right? Like if you look at Susan Fowler, she's a great example of like now and like, um, oh, I just blinked on her name, but the other gal too, who wrote Know My Name. Um, yeah, Chanel Miller. Yes, thank you. But they're thriving like in every way possible. Like they are doing so well and like doing so good, you know? And in the meantime, like the rest of us are like, yeah, I think I'm going to take a lift. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, 
Yeah. Not like, like it's not in the company's like best. Interest. And the main reason that people say I'm going to take a lift is because of the cover up that Uber tried to right. do. Had it's they, had they the initial. Exactly. Yeah. Like, there's research that shows that when a company cares and when they address something, there's no public ramifications for this kind of report. But when they try to cover it up, that's when the public is like, uh-uh, because you're committed to having a harassing culture, you know? Right. Like yeah. you're actually acting in favor of harassment, which is like, why? So like, crazy. are you getting what you need from that? Like, there's no good reason for it. Yeah, so yeah. crazy. Okay, so we have to end with Elizabeth Warren no. um, and just the discussion that has been happening around that. And like, I don't know if I really even have that much to say, except that like her SNL skit was the best. Like, I didn't see it. You have to. Oh my gosh. Well, it was just like a little clip. I didn't see the whole thing, but like I just saw the clip that was floating around social media of, um, oh, what is her name? The blonde gal on SNL. Mm -hmm. um, she plays Elizabeth Warren, you know, and so like at the beginning, like after everything at the beginning, she's like playing this music and she's dancing and they're kind of dressed the same. And Elizabeth Warren is behind her, like doing the same thing. And then they switch like back and forth. Like it's so That's cool. awesome. But I think just this idea, like the main thing that has come out of that is like, oh my gosh, like you know, like the whole discussion around like electability and was she electable? And I think like the best thing that I've heard is like, yes, like women are electable when we elect them. Like when we choose to elect them, they are yeah. electable. You know, when we're ready to elect them, they will be. I mean, I think the trouble is that the research, show, I think we've talked about this, like the research that I've read shows that the American public the consistent characteristics that we vote for in a president are the tallest person and the person who's like not smart, like who's seen as not too smart. And Elizabeth Warren is tall, but she's very smart. And I think that that's a tougher thing. I mean, you add on top of that, the active prejudice against women that we see and it's hard, like in the dream world, we would elect the smart person regardless of their height. <laughs> right? Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, they're like characteristic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The person who's best for the job. But I think it's like consistently been an office where you can really see the prejudice of the American public. No. Totally. And just the like, no matter what people say, their like core beliefs about what makes a good leader, yeah. like the studies that I've seen about like, and, and like thoughts and opinions coming like largely from women too. So it's pretty yeah. like distressing to me, like how we feel about ourselves essentially. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, I think that you see in the Deborah Dugan story, a bunch of women then complaining about Deborah Dugan, right? Like this is not like men attacking women, it's women attacking ourselves. And a lot of times for women, it looks like I'm not prejudiced against other women, but I just am not qualified. I just don't, wouldn't trust myself with this. I, she reminds me of me and I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. And it, it sounds like humility, but it's actually just bias. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, All right. Well, I got to run. I think okay. that, you know, like we keep saying, look for the hero in these stories. Life isn't, is supposed to be sharp. And then like, that's why we're here, I think, to do what, like to take care of the things that we do have control over. Totally. And that we can take in all of this and be present for it, but still create a safe environment for ourselves for and still talk about things and acknowledge that they're happening. Like, yeah, yeah. totally. So, All right. Okay. Love you. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Um...